think we are there. Hello everyone, this is Dr. Joseph Fair, and I am here to talk to you today about COVID-19 and the coronavirus pandemic and answer any questions I might uh, be able to from you uh, while you're sitting at home and have, it, have questions floating around in your head on COVID-19 or the virus that causes it. Um, to introduce myself, I am an NBC science contributor, not a medical contributor, so I'm not a medical doctor. I am a scientist, a virologist, and an epidemiologist and I've spent my career focused on emerging viruses like COVID-19, looking at them uh, usually where they emerge and in what kind of circumstances they do emerge in. So if you wanna start with giving me some, any questions you might have about COVID-19, I'm happy to talk about anything that has, doesn't have to do with medical treatment or at least your own personal medical treatment because I'm not a medical doctor. But that being said, I can try to answer any of your other questions. Throat test or nose test, which is best? They're really gonna be about the same and usually they, they'll take two swabs and mix them together from the throat and the nose uh, just so they can get the most coverage of those areas. So it's gonna be about the same for the throat and the nose, but they're usually gonna combine them anyway. Um, what is the peak all about? So the peak is what we're talking about epidemiologically. Like a lot of things in nature, the peak is, uh, things will happen in a bell curve. And a peak is when we've hit the maximum number of cases that we're going to hit, and then it's going to start coming down um, below that maximum number. We, we have not yet hit our peak of cases in the United States. Can you contract COVID-19 through mosquito bites? The answer is no, you cannot. Um, it has to come into direct contact with you through one of the nasal or respiratory routes or mucous membrane routes like through the eyes. Um, but right as of right now, there's no known knowledge that you can contact uh, COVID-19 through a mosquito bite. Enveloped viruses at, at time don't do well in the biology of the mosquito stomach, which is um, very acidic just like our own, but only certain viruses do well in their stomachs. How long does the virus stay in the air? It depends on where you are and under what circumstances you are. So how long does it physically stay in the air is really seconds. Um, this, you know, as far as I know, uh, the only studies that have been done on this have been used, uh, used an artificial nebulizer. So they kind of purposely sprayed it up into the air. And I don't remember the exact timing on that, but it wasn't incredibly long. Um, there is some thought out there right now, and, and this might be where you're going with the question is, you know, why are we talking about face coverings? And face coverings are because we believe that once you're infected, most of the time when you're first infected, you don't realize it and you're pre-symptomatic. So we'd like people to cover their face because even when we're just talking, you know, excitedly or your breathing starts to become a little more labored, you expel those droplets out into the air and uh, you can directly come into contact with someone that maybe you're not doing the accurate social distancing with and that might be even just someone in your home. Can you have symptoms without a fever and cough? Yes, the, that's the thing about COVID-19 is it's incredibly diverse. Um, there's a lot of different symptoms with it. Um, some trademark symptoms of, of it, I should say, without necessarily feeling ill otherwise is the loss of the taste and the smell. But you can definitely have it without having, you know, fever and coughs. Uh, other symptoms might include, you know, diarrhea, for example. Um, and there's a whole other list. If you go to cdc.gov or who.int, both of those lists, you know, kind of a comprehensive list of, of symptoms that you might have. That being said, a lot of them are symptoms you might have with something else. So don't necessarily think COVID-19 because of that. <clears throat> Can you get this virus again once you've had it once? Um, all of the data right now indicates that no, you won't be reinfected, at least with the same COVID-19. Uh, you can still get other coronaviruses, like another COVID, uh, or sorry, another coronavirus caused uh, cold. Coronaviruses cause your average cold, as well as rhinoviruses. So you can get other coronaviruses, but you know th this COVID-19 will not protect against them, and we don't know how long COVID-19 would be protective if you survive it. Um, we think anywhere from a matter of months to a year, but we don't have any data to point to that yet. Only time is going to tell us how, how immune people are to this over time. 
will transmission die down in the, later in the summer months? That is our hope, and we're just basing that honestly purely on the, the previous uh, respiratory diseases that we know about, which are coronaviruses, rhinoviruses, influenza. All of them tend to slow down in the summer months because of the number of daylight hours that we have, uh, and we spend a lot more time outside during those months, so we're not in confined uh, scenarios, even with our families as much. And so the UV light from the sunlight is what breaks down the viruses in the summer. And um, we're hoping we'll see that with COVID-19. Um, that being said, there are, case, there are cases rather around the equator right now, and the virus is spreading pretty heavily in those areas. And those places, even though it's impossible for them to maintain the social distancing that we're talking about with the way their societies live right now, um, the virus is still, pretty, is still spreading pretty heavily in those areas and they have a lot of sunlight going on right now is my point. So will COVID-19 necessarily slow down in the, later in the summer months? I'm not absolutely sure, but every indication is if it's based on other respiratory diseases, yes. Uh, that's what we're hoping for. Um, that being said, we'll still have to be maintaining that social distancing just because you get colds and flus in the summer. Um, should you be wearing masks in your backyards? In your backyards, no, you know, unless you're in really close proximity to others that are not immediately from your household or you're around someone that is uh, in a high risk group, you don't have to worry about, you know, wearing a mask in your backyard uh, if you're just out doing yard work and those kind of things. Um, there's uh, minuscule to no chance of, of you getting a virus this way or getting this virus that way. Um, I don't have a prediction for how long we're looking at social isolation. It really, honestly, the answer to that, it depends on when the entire country decides to do it at the same time. Um, obviously, the sooner we come to that decision of the entire country doing it and at the same time, the sooner this will be over. But right now, you know, certain states are doing it, certain states are not. Um, we definitely are going to see a rise in the cases in the states that are not doing it, the states that have done it and that have continued to do it. They're definitely seeing lowering or flattening of their curves. So um, as a nation, I hope all of our governors are going to come together and you know, kind of make unanimous decisions for the states, but right now we don't have that. Um, at a minimum though, I would say anywhere from four to ten weeks into the near future. Um, probably longer than that realistically, but at a minimum I'd say four to ten weeks. I know that's not a great answer, but it's a realistic one. How do we prevent these kind of situations in the future and uh, with any kind of new viruses? Um, you know, that's a, something that I honestly spend a lot of my time uh, thinking about. It's one of the things I do professionally uh, with Texas A&M University. I work on pandemic policy. And so, you know, these moments, as painful as they are, uh, represent, you know, one of the only times in public health where we actually get attention enough to even be on someone's uh, important list, I would say, from either, you know, the Congress or Senate. We always have a few congressmen and senators uh, that work with us and um, that are supportive of our efforts. That being said, you know, public health is usually seen as something completely different uh, from national security. So uh, we have known for a long time that we've been well overdue for a pandemic and we fought for funds during those kinds of time, during those times, knowing that we weren't ready. So every year, uh, you know, a dance going before uh, Congress and the Senate and talking about how important these, uh, these pandemics are and could be to our nation's future and how this kind of thing could happen. Uh, and usually, you know, we get some, I would say, probably what I would call paltry funding to kind of look at these situations around the world uh, and monitor them as they're happening. Um, and, you know, we had just faced years and years in the last two to three years, especially of major cuts to those programs. And so with that, with that being said, these are the only times where people are really aware that there are people out there looking for these things to happen and watching for them increasingly happen to happening, as they should say, and um, right now are the moments that we hope that most people don't forget that, you know, this is not a one-time situation, that it'll happen again, and it's likely to happen worse after this. Sorry, that's a big one for me, but that one's philosophical. 
Hi, I'm from India. We stand with the USA in this difficult time. Th thank you very much, and USA, the United States stands with India as well. Thank you for watching. Uh, is the virus a form of chemical warfare? No. There were a lot of conspiracy theories uh, really rather early on uh, that this was a military virus, both from China and then from China to the U.S. military, saying the U.S. military released the virus. Uh, I actually worked in the lab where this virus was first isolated, and I know the scientists uh, quite well there. And uh, this is the Chinese National Academy of Sciences, and you know, in our U.S. National Academy of Sciences, just like in China, it's really the, the most important place you can go to, to work as a, as a scientist and be recognized by your country. Um, so, you know, that this scientist unfortunately is under kind of 24-7 lock and key right now just because uh, she has so many death threats from the conspiracy, conspiracy theories about her and her group online, uh, even though they got the data out, you know, as fast as they possibly could, and that's what the world's been working off of uh, for our own data, for our own data, and to actually um, recognize and treat the virus. Is the virus airborne? No, it is not an airborne virus. Um, an airborne virus means that it's lighter than air, and that means it's free floating, and that you know you can someone can cough, and you can walk by maybe uh, two minutes later and walk through that virus and then, you know, still get it. Uh, this one lasts much less, much less time in the air and it's kind of a, you know, a droplet out and then the droplet falls. Uh, we do not know this to be an airborne virus yet, but we do know that people can transmit it before they're symptomatic. And so that's why we're recommending the face coverings for everyone. Can your dog get it? We know of at least one dog uh, that, uh, that did get it and that was a Pomeranian in Hong Kong. Uh, you've seen today or yesterday probably that there's been a few lions that have gotten this as well. Uh, it's not uncommon for animals that uh, especially humans have spent a lot of time around in our history, dogs and cats and various species of those, uh, of those animals, uh, that they can get our viruses and we can get theirs. And so there's a lot of diseases that we transmit back and forth to our pets uh, kind of on a normal basis. So. Respiratory disease is a particular one uh, for anybody that's ever gone and saw like great apes uh, in one of the game parks, you know, those are things where you have to wear a mask because specifically we know that our colds and our flus, our coronaviruses and our influenza viruses can kill them just as well as their colds and flus can kill us. Um, let's see, reading through your questions a little here. Is it true the virus cannot survive in hot temperature like in the tropics? Um, it's a not to do with the temperature, it's, amount, it's, a, it's actually the due, due to the amount of sunlight that you get, uh, the UV light and the sunlight. Um, the heat does not affect the virus nearly as much. Heat and humidity actually allow the virus to survive longer. Uh, so it's more so the amount of uh, actual UV light that you get. Um, How can you protect your service dogs when you have to go out? Really, you know, you don't have anything to worry about, I would say, with your service dogs. Um, I, you know, the, to, to be honest with you, I don't know the answer to that, I should say, is a better answer to you. Um, I'm assuming, you know, I don't know how to, you know, to recommend to them to socially distance, but they should be fine, uh, I would think, um, as long as they're not, you know, coming into contact with a lot of other people. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer for you on that. I will look into that though and see if we can publish something on that. Um, I'll look up a better answer for you than I don't know and let me find out. <laughs> um, how long does the virus live on surface objects? Um, you know, we've looked into this a lot and you know, in the laboratory it can last up to, up to nine days, not COVID-19, but coronaviruses. So I like to give that uh, figure up to nine days. That being said, you know, I like when people just don't focus on how long it can last and they focused on pretending that everything is actually infected before they actually touch it. Um, that way you really keep yourself safe if you just pretend like there's virus on it and you're always gonna keep something between yourself and that surface or you're going to clean that surface. Um, can the virus come through an open window? Um, no, the virus, um, you know, unless there's someone standing directly outside that window and coughing inside on you, it cannot come through an open window. I keep my open my windows open quite often, and um, 
I, the fresh air actually helps you uh, get through things like these, so I actually recommend it, um, but that's definitely not a way to get it. Uh, how about by a broken skin or a cut on a hand? Um, we don't know this to be a bloodborne pathogen, so at least until now, you know, we've had no um, studies to indicate that, you know, you can take the blood from one animal that's infected and put it into another one. Uh, that being said, you know, that's, those are, that's science that's going on right now, um, but right now it's only through the mucosal membranes. Usually viruses will, depending on the type of virus they are, will enter your body through a preferred route. In the case of coronaviruses, it's through your mucosal membranes and then down through your lungs. Uh, and other viruses, say, such as HIV, enter through the bloodstream, and that's what we call a bloodborne pathogen. So this is not a bloodborne pathogen, and um, we don't think it can be transmitted that way. Um, when should you expect the peak to happen? So the peak, again, is talking about the epidemiological curve, and it goes up into a bell curve. Um, the peak really depends on, you know, when we all start doing the social distancing right now, I would say probably a third of the country is really implementing very strict social distancing. Um, and I would say the rest of the country is not doing so. Um, around the third of the country, maybe a little more, are following the guidelines pretty strictly. Um, but there are places that are not following the guidelines. So the peak um, has a lot of valleys to it and you'll see fluctuation in it. Um, we've seen flattened numbers here in New York over the past few days and that's a good thing. But you know, as an epidemiologist and having seen this a lot of times during outbreaks, we try not to get too excited over these small little wins, even though we celebrate them ourselves, uh, just because things tend to go back up pretty quickly. And it turns out just to, in the overall picture, in the overall scheme of things, not being much of a valley itself, it just went down for a few days. So we try to let that go on for a lot longer before we become excited and think we're at a plateau. Um, how do you know if you've been exposed? There's really, you know, there's honestly no way to, to test for it. Uh, only if someone that you know um, has told you that, you know, they're COVID-19 positive, um, would you know in that case? Um, otherwise, there's not much out there right now. There's a lot of apps and things like that, but uh, to be honest, there's so many of them, it's kind of hard to keep track of at the moment. Um, presumably someone would, you know, in a normal case, do contract tracing for you and they would be in touch with you. Um, but right now, you know, the system is just simply overwhelmed and I, it depends on where you are if you have contract tracers that would be able to do that. Um, you've noticed many COVID um, victims have medical issues and or are, have uh, obesity. And so will, be in phys will being a good physical condition help fight COVID? Um, it does help, and especially if you don't have any of the underlying you know, conditions, um, uh, that would be heart disease, diabetes. Uh, if you're a smoker, um, there's a number of other underlying conditions that are considered high risk, anything affecting the lung asthmatic, et cetera. That being said, you know, you can't really have a false uh, sense of security. Uh, and especially if you're a healthcare worker, there have been a lot of uh, in really good physical condition healthcare workers that just frankly, they've gotten exposed to much higher doses. And so um, there is um, a false sense of security with being young because we've had a lot of young people um, I don't know necessarily all of the underlying conditions that were play, if, in, if any, with, with those cases, but a 17-year-old from New Orleans, at least a one 35-year-old here from New York, um, and not all of those were healthcare workers, obviously, the 17-year-old nor the 35-year-old were. Um, they were just in normal jobs. So um, being in better condition helps. Um, to not have any of those underlying conditions helps, but it does not make you invincible. Uh, where did this virus come from? Was it man-made? It uh, was not man-made. You know, we've done the epidemiological study. When I say we, I mean kind of the scientific community and virologists and, and epidemiologists and people that focus their careers on this. Um, but the studies have been done looking at the genome of this virus and comparing it to say SARS, which is the, the name for this virus is actually called SARS-CoV-2. 
and that's what causes COVID-19. And so it's called, called that SARS-CoV-2 because SARS is called SARS-CoV. So this is like the first cousin to SARS. Um, and what we've determined from all of those evolutionary studies was that this was just an evolutionarily uh, very close cousin to SARS and it was a very natural mutation, or not even a mutation, rather, it's a very natural um, kind of change in the genome of SARS coronavirus that you know allowed this virus to eventually emerge. Uh, this is not a new virus, it was just new to humans and had never been in human beings before this time. Um, are you better off if you get the flu and pneumonia shots? Um, I would only say yes because for the flu shot at least, it allows flu to largely be ruled out as something that might be affecting you, so we always recommend getting the flu shot um, for that reason. Um, the, pneumonia, the pneumonia shot you know, would help you, obviously, if you have bacterial-induced pneumonia. Um, this is a viral-induced pneumonia, so there's not necessarily cross-protectivity for the pneumonia shot, but having both of those things are in your favor. Um, does an asymptomatic test positive or negative? Uh, that really depends. So if you're asymptomatic, but you are virus positive, you'll test positive. Um, and that's using the swab test of the nose and the throat. You'll test positive on that. How can we go about since not every state is staying home and not everyone wears masks? Um, you know, the best you can do is when you do go out, make sure that you're doing those things and still practicing the social distancing. Um, I've noticed a lot of people are already becoming lax on the social distancing, especially when it comes with to standing within six feet of one another. Um, and I see a lot of people not taking that seriously or forgetting about it. Um, sorry, just reading through here what I haven't already answered. What is your take on asymptomatic carriers, especially healthcare workers transmitting the virus in healthcare settings? So um, it's a real possibility uh, that that's happening. Um, we're only now realizing the role of asymptomatic carriers and their potential role in the really explosive transmission of this virus. And so that is again why we're urging everyone now, um, even healthy persons, uh, myself included and others, uh, to wear face masks when we are outside and you know in public settings, especially like the grocery pharmacy If you're considered an essential worker wearing of that face covering so that if you are asymptomatic um, That you're not transmitting it if you're a healthcare worker and coming home to a family that is um, That you're you know then exposing we're recommending to those individuals that they actually wear a mask at home and socially distance as much as possible uh, as difficult as that may be Um, is COVID-19 contagious if someone blows cigarette smoke in your face? Um, that's a good question. I, I can't speak to the science of it, but all I can say, if they're close enough for the cigarette smoke to get into your face, then they're close enough to breathe something onto you. Uh, so you'd have enough reason to be upset either way, cigarette smoke or uh, breathing COVID-19 onto you, either one. Here's a great question. Does the amount of concentration of virus you're infected with determine the severity of the infection, assuming um, all else is equal? It, it absolutely does. And that's why you're seeing a lot more healthcare workers uh, actually die from the disease. And so the healthcare worker, and that's why we say, you know, we always reserve those protective masks and shields and everything like that for them they get exposed to the highest dosages of the virus. And so that dose is like, if you imagine it uh, as a bullet, it's a bigger and bigger and bigger bullet. Uh, each time they see a really uh, ill patient, that means that patient's viral load or the amount of virus that's in that patient's blood uh, or body is at its highest point. So when they're coughing or when they're labored breathing, they're breathing out really, really high amounts of virus and that healthcare worker is exposed to all of that. And so that's why you see, you know, really kind of young nurses and uh, doctors and other healthcare workers, frontline workers getting sick and not recovering from this. Sorry, I don't know the answer about the stimulus, stimulus checks or when they're going to be sent out.
Um, how far does it travel? Um, we know that you know the average person when they cough or sneeze, it's three to six feet. Um, measles, for example, which is a lot more contagious than this virus, can travel up to you know say ten to twelve feet, um, and that is what you would consider an airborne virus, measles, but not this one. Uh, there are a lot of cloth masks, and I heard they're not reliable, Barbara says. So um, the cloth mask is not there to protect you. It is actually to protect others from you if you're asymptomatic and transmitting the virus because we know so many people are. So, you know, it may offer you some mediocre protection, you know, against uh, your nose and your, your mouth, um, but it's really to protect others from getting it from you if you're healthy and accidentally transmitting the virus asymptomatically or pre-symptomatically. Um, this is um, a funny question, uh, but it's actually uh, a good one. If someone with COVID-19 in a restaurant accidentally spits on your food while preparing it, I don't know if they'll accidentally spit on your food. Can you get COVID-19 by your, your food? Um, that's why I say stick with hot food. Um, there is, you know, a theoretical possibility that yes, you could get COVID-19 uh, that way, but I have to emphasize it, it's incredibly low. Um, you know, what you do have to think about, you know, you shouldn't be in an accident, you shouldn't be in a restaurant right now anyway, but if you are in a restaurant and you're talking about someone preparing your food and bringing it to you, um, you know, I recommend sticking to hot foods and one you can microwave uh, in that way. Um, because that way you can at least make sure that it's okay. But otherwise, don't go out to a restaurant. You shouldn't be going out to a restaurant right now. Um, is it safe to assume those that are asymptomatic or have few symptoms have exposed to a, a low viral load? Um, it may be that. Uh, it also may be the person's genetics, uh, or it may be a combination of both, and it probably is a combination of both. We usually find that with viruses. Viruses are usually, um, they take millions of years to adopt to their host. We humans are a new host to them, so we're trying to see you know, what, their, what the effects of this one in particular is on humans and why we're seeing so many different outcomes and symptoms with it. It may be something genetic with the virus, it may be something genetic with the human, or it may be both, and it's probably both. Um, so some videos are touting quinine and zinc as preventative measures. Is this along, sign as, along the same line as other ineffective and possibly harmful home remedies? You know, really what this would be is the essential uh, drinking like tonic water, a lot of tonic water uh, for the quinine, and then um, taking like the uh, like Zycam type product for a cold. Um, where the active ingredient in that is zinc. Um, and to be honest, you know, that's something I've thought about myself. I don't know what the answer is on whether it would have effectiveness on COVID-19 or if it specifically has effectiveness on coronaviruses. If it, proved, if, if it is effective on uh, colds and like the, making the, the um, symptoms of the cold last less time, then presumably it would do the same thing for this. I have some myself, so I know if I started filling the symptoms, I would probably take like the Zycam myself uh, in addition to kind of the other things I would do if I was sick. Do I see an end to this virus? Uh, yes, there will be an end. Uh, it's not gonna be anytime terribly soon, unfortunately. Um, and we'll be with this until the next year at least. Uh, we may have dips in that time where we're not seeing as much death and um, kind of cases. Uh, hopefully we'll see that in this time, but um, we will see it in the fall and ultimately we'll keep seeing it until we have a vaccine or eventually you know, it's kind of spread throughout the nation and people have all had it or have not had it by that point. And uh, we have a larger immune population, at least for some time being. Um, what is the clinical risk of using a vaccine that has not been through a human clinical trial versus a shorter uh, trial? So, you know, there are obviously more risk uh, to doing that. Uh, a vaccine usually takes 15 to 20 years to get through. Um, this is what they would call an emergency use vaccine. Uh, the same was true for the Ebola vaccine. 
Uh, in 2014, there was no Ebola vaccine. Um, now there is a, an Ebola vaccine, and tens of, tens of thousands of people, including myself, have had it. And um, that would still be what's called an experimental vaccine, but it's made by Merck, uh, the pharmaceutical company. And um, and I, you know, I, I got along with everyone else that was working on the Ebola trials. Um, so what do we risk? We risk, you know, not having, you know, 10 years of data about what all the long-term effect of this vaccine will be against our bodies because, you know, in that particular case, it uses a live virus from another virus, human or vesicular stomatitis virus, uh, with a part of Ebola in it. So what is the long-term effect of infecting myself with that? And, you know, are there any long-term effects? If they are, what are they, um, et cetera. So there are more risks with it, but in uh, cases like this, uh, it'll be absolutely incredible for us to rush to market something, you know, that is anywhere from 12 to 18 months from now. And even that is being extremely ambition, Im, ambitious uh, just with what's out there now. Um, I have asthma. If I get this, will I die? You know, you're in a higher risk group. That does not mean you'll die from it. Um, but you do want to take extra precaution. Um, everything we've talked about, you know, and more and being extremely rigorous uh, with this just because, uh, you know, asthma is a, is a lung condition and anything affecting the lung is gonna make you, give you a higher risk for this, uh, for developing the disease, rather. Uh, if J&J &J has finished animal trials with their vaccine, why do they have to wait until September to start the human trials? It'll take between now and then to actually review the data from the animals and then determine if there, any of the data from the animals needs to be repeated. Um, and you really do want that because otherwise, um, it, without doing it now, then you're going to be jabbing a lot of people with something that you know has just been through one round of animal trials. And that's not really incredibly representative. Usually we would do a lot more than that. So it just could be really dangerous for the people. Uh, so that's why you're going to see uh, a, a heavy review of what they've done in animals and if they need to redo any of it before um, that can be put into people. Will people who have passed because of COVID-19 still have the active uh, virus that can be transmitted? Um, theoretically, you know, the body would still be infectious. Uh, that being said, you know, uh, any of the areas that, you know, any of the ways that it would be transmitted through the oral uh, route, through um, nasal route, or through the eyes um, would theoretically not, you know, be um, touched at least uh, by anyone except the, 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 work, the persons working with the bodies. And so um, it's doubtful, um, but yes, um, infectious, usually with most infectious diseases, the body remains infectious for uh, at least some period of time. Uh, I have about five more minutes to answer your questions for today. Uh, do Vicks inhalers and stuff like that can help in keeping the lungs open? Um, yeah, I, uh, you know, I would assume they do. Uh, that being said, that's a nebulizer, and um, unless it gets extremely hot, you know, you risk um, actually. If there happens to be someone in the room that actually has the virus, you risk making it more, you know, kind of spreading it throughout the room. So I'd probably avoid that, to be honest with you, um, unless you need it for some reason. Um, sorry, just going through your questions here. The best thing is to remain calm, clean, and rested, right, Doc? Yes, that is uh, my advice, uh, absolutely, is to, re to remain calm, clean, and rested. Um, you know, it's easy to forget kind of the things that we're talking about here, you know, with the social distancing. It's awkward, it's hard. Um, you know, I, I've been saying to everyone, welcome to the life of an outbreak responder. This is uh, how we live a lot of our lives uh, with not with very little contact with other people. Uh, usually we're in places where it's really hard to get, you know, uh, good things to eat and so forth. And so this is how we're used to living, uh, except, you know, I'm doing it from the middle of New York City this time. So um, get some exercise, think about things other than COVID-19, um, you know, read books that you've been meaning to read and that are still lying there not unread and uh, get to know your family better is all I can recommend for you at this time. Um, but 
you know, this is something that we will get through. Um, it is just going to take uh, time to get through it and it makes you kind of refocus on what's important to you. Um, is the fever constant or does it come and go? You know, uh, fever is very variable. Some people don't even get fever. Um, so unfortunately there's no single answer to that. Um, do you have chest pains? Um, I don't know if I have seen that in the data or not on the chest pains. I'm sorry, I apologize, but um, that's not one that I know the answer to um, about the chest pains. The reason I would say yes is because of you know breathing difficulty and associated chest pains with that. But uh, as far as like clinical chest pains um, with regards to any kind of like myocardial infarction, I don't know about that. Um, if symptoms can vary age to age, uh, they can, and at least we know, you know, anyone older than 65 is in a higher risk group, definitely anyone older than 80 to 85 in the highest risk group. Um, and especially if they have any of the underlying conditions that we've talked about, you know, be they um, uh, anything to do with the respiratory system, anything causing immunocompromised systems like chemotherapy um, and um, anyone that has obviously smoked or vapes, they're going to be in a higher risk group as well. Um, if one was sick in January and February, uh, can one have already had it? You could have had it during that time. Um, it's not for sure that's what you had, but until you have an antibody test or a serology test, which is your antibody test, you won't know. Um, it's important to have those tests once they're available because that will allow you to actually trans or trans not transfer, donate plasma to someone uh, that is acutely in the fight for their life for uh, against COVID-19. Cold, warm, or hot water when washing hands, does it matter? Ideally, it is, you know, warm, warmer to hotter water, but um, as long as you're getting a lot of soap and uh, a lot of friction between your hands, uh, you'll be fine at any temperature. Um, something is always better than nothing. Um, should you throw away Walmart bags, you know, um, just put them in an area where they're not going to be used or moved for quite some time. Um, like I said, you know, we know that it'll last up to nine days on certain surfaces. So if it's ideally not going to be used or moved in that nine days, um, then put it somewhere like that. Otherwise I would say, you know, get rid of them at some point, um, take them back to the store or whatever you need to do with them. What if a person that doesn't run fevers but have other symptoms? Um, you know, right now, the answer I give everyone is that, um, while I see the comment, paranoia isn't good, breathe. Um, it's true, uh, paranoia is not good, but in this certain time, um, it's good to at least be paranoid that, you know, everything might be COVID-19 because you don't want to inadvertently spread it to someone else. And so, um, even myself, if I'm, you know, feeling any kind of symptom, I, I'd start to treat it like it might be COVID-19 and start to take the appropriate um, precautions um, when doing so. And so, um, you know, wearing a facial covering and things like that. All right, I'll take three more questions. We live in Phoenix and it gets very hot. Could we see the slowdown faster in an area like this? You could indeed, with your number of daylight hours, uh, see it slow down uh, a lot faster. I also live in New Orleans, which is really hot. Um, that being said, we're not seeing a slowdown in that area, even though it's already getting hot and we're seeing a lot more daylight hours. Um, so it's not a given that it will slow down a lot faster, but um, if we see it like cold and flu seasons, then presumably, yes, you could. Um, why are public swimming pools closing? They're closing because um, people are in close proximity to one another in public swimming pools and we need a distance of at least six feet per person um, in this time of social distancing. Does undergoing chemo treatments make you highly susceptible? Uh, it does make you more susceptible to getting the disease part associated with infection with SARS-CoV-2. Um, and so that is um, one of the reasons that, you know, having chemo lowers your immune system and a lowered immune system will make you have a worse outcome. 
Okay, I apologize, but I'm going to have to go from here. Um, thank you for watching, and uh, we'll come back to you again uh, at some point in the next week uh, with another session. But uh, I'm sorry I didn't get to all your questions, but please come back with them or uh, email them to us, and we'll try to get to them but next week. Thanks. Bye-bye.